I'm very pleased to welcome back my guest today to the Old Grey Mayor's podcast. He was a three-term councillor for the City of Waterloo. During his last two terms, he was chair of the Finance Committee. Today, we're going to have a good conversation about all things municipal financial. <laughs> I want to welcome back Jeff Henry to the Old Grey Mayor's podcast. Jeff, welcome. Thanks, Rob. Glad to be back. Listen, uh, how how's Kate and Finn? How are they all doing? Oh, I think we're we're weathering the the winter blues uh, so far. You know, you get these waves of sickness that come through schools, and we're just oh. hopefully coming off one right now. So, well, say hi to Kate for me. And uh, I have to say, uh, ever since the last podcast, when I learned you were you're working in uh, in planning, I think it was, was it IBI that you're with. Uh, yeah, now now Arcadis. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, saw that. yeah. I saw that because I use yeah. IBI for the odd thing and I saw the uh, different name change. Uh, and so every time I see anything in the newspaper where there's a presentation on some planning idea, I'm looking to see who's the planner that's uh, involved because I'm waiting to see if it's your name, especially if it's some innovative project that's uh, going on in, in town. Uh, and there are two of those, but that's not what we're talking about today. I've been no, in the no, paper no, a couple no, of times. Yeah, no, yeah. no, but just saying that uh, it, it's always interesting for me to see. It. And I'm glad, you know, and I'm glad you're involved in planning because I think you're someone that uh, uh, has a lot of creative ideas. And if you can't do it uh, on behalf of the municipality, at least you're doing it on behalf of the community in this private uh, context. You, you so, see different sides of the table, and I think it's always enlightening to see different sides of it. Well, the nice thing is uh, you bring that perspective of having been on the uh, municipal side of the table. So you have an understanding or appreciation for what's going on behind closed doors, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so the last time we were chatting, we were we were talking about Northdale and that project. And that was uh, really a, a first term project for you, Northdale, correct? Uh, first term, first meeting, first day. Yeah, right out of the gate. <laughs> okay, right out of the gate. <laughs> Sometimes I'm I'm talking to people like Melissa Durrell, and we're talking about a park that took five or six years to to get uh, wound up. But you were right into it, full full deep in right away. Yeah, I think um, as we talked about, eighteen months from start to finish to get a plan in place, and then you know years in actually implementing it. And I think that's what we're getting into. Yeah, yeah. So that and that's the thing uh, that I wanted to bring up because uh, I've had some recent conversations. And we talk about capital plans or forecasts and budgets, and, and and you've got the one side of the sheet that shows all these great things you like to do, but then there's the other side of the sheet that shows how's it going to be funded, right? That's that that other side of the equation that sometimes people don't think about, and that's what moves things down the line sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And and in Northdale's case, one of the biggest challenges you have when you're effectively upzoning a 1950s suburban neighborhood uh, into allowing six, 12, uh, 12 stories uh, and a lot more density, which boy, do we need uh, additional housing around universities these days. It's yes. uh, uh, it, you, You've got old infrastructure. It's uh, 70 years old now. Uh, if it's still on the ground and it was sized for the use of the day, which were, you know, bungalows on large lots rather than, uh, you know, six and 12 story apartment buildings. So one of the one of the first challenges that you know, we had to grapple with during the planning, but then in the aftermath was, what do you do with that? How do you make sure that yeah. uh, you've got water and sewer and, and modern stormwater infrastructure, not 1950s stormwater infrastructure, but modern infrastructure to deal with when it rains a lot? Let me just, uh, I just want to make sure yeah. the listeners understand this. So we're talking about a lot that has a single home, maybe three bedroom, likely three bedroom. And now on that same lot, you're looking to put are you, a five to six story building. Uh, or up to 12, depending on where you were, uh, where you were heading. You and put so a couple lots got together all and these you can bathrooms, two minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All these yep. bathrooms, all these sinks, all that stuff, showers, everything else, just multiply many times over from what was originally anticipated uh, 70 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the cautions I was I was given early on in the Northdale process was that the infrastructure may not be able to handle it. So in parallel with the, the Northdale work, we've been doing some broader master planning on, on water and sanitary and, and storm and finding some bottlenecks in the city to growth where you want to be able to put growth, but the pipes couldn't support that. Right. And so council unlocked a few of those projects by borrowing against development charges, you know, future contributions from developers from growth to, to right. pay for growth um, to advance some of those bottlenecks. But in, that wasn't going to solve, you know, that on this lot in the middle of the neighborhood, 
uh, the pipe from the main trunk up to up to there wasn't wasn't large enough. So the innovative approach that that we take in here, recognizing it was going to take a couple of decades to go in and fully upgrade the the, the Northdale neighborhood, was uh, to allow developers when they come in to extend and upsize the particular infrastructure they needed up to the up to their lot, right? So from wherever it was fine up to where they were building and right. so we had maybe a dozen projects in total that upfronted the cost of of those infrastructure upgrades so that they could be serviced and they could be built be because of the plan said we should build it the demand says we should build it but the water supply or the sanitary supply said you know there's pipes too small uh, and and needed some work uh and and i think what was really curious about this one was, you know, typically when you let somebody advance the timing of your infrastructure by, by right. paying for it, when you get to actually replacing it, you know, two, five, 10 years down the road, you'd pay them back for the work. But the city, <laughs> we're going to have the money for, uh, for, for that at the time. We said, no, if you want to go now, you pay. We're not reimbursing you. And as I said, a dozen projects uh, uh, advanced that, uh, and that municipal that, infrastructure for us. Yeah. And that really... That kind of like blew my mind a bit uh, it, from a municipal like uh, knowledge base uh, perspective that and, and I and I totally understand where you're coming from, because I, I think I find sometimes counselors don't show enough, maybe backbone, pushback, courage uh, when dealing with developers to take this more aggressive stance, negotiation, negotiating stance, because at the end of the day, Developers want to build in, like, for example, Waterloo. Who doesn't want to build in Waterloo? You know, Waterloo itself, to be able to build in Waterloo is a, is almost like an asset itself that you can push back to builders and say, oh, look, this is what you got to do. If you're not going to do it, someone else will come by and do it. So I, I commend you for that 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 approach. Yeah, and the, the, the trade-off from that is, you know, you might be cutting into a road several times. Every new project might cut a little bit further, might cut a little bit further. And so there are there are some disruptions to that. Right. And it means that on a street like Albert Street, where that's being done, heading up from University Avenue up the hill on a number yeah. of projects, well, now it's been, you know, surfaced on top of it. It's got the key piece of infrastructure underneath it. And so uh, in terms of the decision for when does the city come along and reconstruct that road, put in the separated bike lanes, give the wider sidewalks and the pedestrian lighting, all the stuff that came from our Northdale streetscape plan. Well, that gets pushed out because when you run it through the decision support system for asset management, we'll talk about later today. Yeah. Um, it, it, it comes out near the bottom. It's like, you know what? Your underground's fine. So we don't need to do the top. Right, uh, right, he, and that was that was the LRT thing ahead of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was the LRT thing, uh, replacing all that underground infrastructure that was, you know, corduroy roads and everything else that got discovered. Discovered, but uh, a lot of I, that infrastructure I, I, was old. Yeah, I remember uh, the Victorian uh, water pipe that we replaced in King Street South. I say Victorian <laughs> era because Queen Victoria was on the throne when it went in, uh, <laughs> and it wasn't caught. It was that one wasn't caught because it was just outside the project limits. But as soon right. as Grand Link got in there, they, they you know, you, you excavate some stuff, you look at this pipe and you say, um, guys, we're kind of worried that okay. if we construct here, that's going to break. So do you want to add to our scope of work and we'll replace it for you? And, you know, the city and the region yeah. talk. And we said, yeah, it, it was an 1880s pipe. We'd lined it at some point in the 1980s, but it could crack. There was a risk. Uh, so yeah. why not replace a Victorian era pipe with a uh, pipe with uh, something from the 21st century? So on this Northdale approach, then uh, the alternative would have been borrowing against future development charges, DC development charges that that builders would be paying every time they're ready to build on a lot. Well, yeah, if we were trying to really advance a whole bunch of road work, um, We'd have had to go into debt. There wasn't enough money. And you you borrow against the potential for future growth, your right. forecasted future growth. But when that growth comes, uh, you, you don't know, right? You, anything could happen, as we've yeah. learned <laughs> over the last decade. Anything can happen. Yeah. Uh, and, well, and well, slow down and building, and right? Yeah. Slow down yeah, and yeah. building. Now, now uh, best laid plans are impacted because the building uh, isn't being constructed as you uh, as you had hoped, uh, projecting yeah, so out into future I mean, years. Yeah. So the one road we went ahead with, so Spruce Street and the outlet on, on Hickory to King, uh, we did because that was a major bottleneck, particularly for stormwater, 
for not just Northdale, but also the neighborhood to the north of it, there were some flow problems. And, and Spruce Street was also the most built up already in terms of being developed. So it made sense right. to go first because you weren't going to cut yep. into it 16 more times. Uh, and so that went first. You got to see what the new streetscapes are going to look like. But that was a piece the city had to advance because it was substantial. You're not going to get somebody to pay for 15 meters of of your massive trunk storm sewer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, when you talk about Albert Street from University, you're talking like University to Columbia, Albert Street along that that route, yeah, for example. Up the hill. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and I can remember back in the day, like I'm talking uh, early '80s, uh, when my friends were living in those homes, going to to Laurier. Right uh, now, that that is just transformed. Well, I'd say tremendously uh, in terms of what's there now. Yeah, ab absolutely. It's been a huge change to the to the skyline. But that was one sort of way that we had to deal with paying it. And the rest, you know, over the 20 years, all the roads will eventually get done. They'll get done in the usual way, funded partly by development charges and partly by regular capital dollars, because it's not all about growth, right? Some of that's just like fixing what you've got. You can't yeah. use development charges for it. It's only the growth portion. So there's a split and and that'll happen over over the course of the next 10, 15, 15 years. What was the what was the reception like when you said uh, you know we're not paying you back? I I don't know. Uh, it uh, I never heard anything about it, so I can tell you that. Right? And no, That's nobody good. started calling counselors uh, <laughs> right. and and saying what are you people doing? I think everybody was was ready to grow and ready to go, and and they accepted that as a way of advancing a project uh, many years. And and the numbers from what I saw in the agreements that came back, these were five figures, not six figures. So. Um, Oh, I don't okay. Want to call so it the work, yeah. right? The, okay. So the work to be done wasn't in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, the tens of thousands, and yeah. it was uh, they could uh, it was acceptable. Uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't want to call it a rounding error, but on a thirty million dollar development project, um, you know, thirty or forty thousand uh, dollars isn't isn't large in the grand scheme no, of things. No, 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 no. That's right. So that's why you wouldn't get that sort of uh, the, that sort of pushback, and th and that was the issue too. I mean, you were a bit forewarned by the mayor of the day that, hey, don't get your hopes up on the Northdale plan, for example. Yeah, turns out we could be creative and solve the uh, solve the infrastructure problem uh, over time, right? It's uh, you can deal with part of it and just keep dealing with it rather than, you know, be stymied by not having a full solution on day one. Well, I think that speaks to, too, bringing in on new people uh, from time to time under council and coming up with these innovative ideas and, and testing. The, you know, why, can, why can't we do it this way, right? Just asking that why question. Yeah, absolutely. Most important question in politics and in life. So just on the uh, capital. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes you don't want to hear your kids always asking why, but you'll wait. You'll, you'll hear that from Finn in the future, but anyway, that's, that's, <laughs> not in the future, but that's how you learn. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so just on the, the whole uh, capital concept then in terms of uh, that capital forecast, um, the funding is always the biggest issue in terms of trying to figure out where that's going to come from. And, and, and we're limited. I mean, we're, we're always hopeful that we're going to receive, you know, by good grace grants from our higher levels of government uh, money. They take from us that sits in their coffers and then they decide what programs they're going to support when they dole it back to us. Yeah. No. And, and being able to fund capital projects is, uh, uh, takes a lot of work and a lot of planning. And I think most people don't appreciate, and the media often doesn't appreciate and so doesn't reflect it well, the difference between your day-to-day -day operating budget and your and your capital budget, right? It's like, how much does it cost to pay your water bill operating budget versus replacing your water heater, your capital budget, right? In yeah, your home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and yeah. and the, so, so your property tax calculation, like the revenue calculation for the city, property taxes, user fees, some grants, uh, you know, most of that money is is for the operating needs, the day to day you know, running, running the city, recreation programs, library transfers, staffing for all these things, doing basic maintenance and, and day to day activities. But you're also putting a chunk of that money aside into various capital reserve funds so that you can save up enough money to do projects. As you know, yes. operating budget looks about the same year one to year two to year three to year four. You might tweak some things. But you're doing the same stuff for the most part. And but but a capital budget is like building a new arena. It doesn't come along every day. 
uh, that's choppy, right? You save right. money for 10 years, you pay for it for the 10 years afterwards too. And it's this huge hit in one year. So these yes. reserve funds are designed to help smooth out your ability to fund those things yeah. and to plan. And so and that's, that's so the capital that's versus found. operating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what I found is I had this conversation with John Gazzola. We were talking about the center and the square and uh, the operating side of it. And he said one of the problems was that, uh, you know, they ran into difficulties when uh, council wouldn't provide them sufficient funds for those capital projects to not, you know, we're not talking about building it. We're talking about maintaining it. And so now you're dipping into operating funds because there's some in significant infrastructure, capital improvements or replacements that you have to do just to keep the facility operating. And yeah, nobody, nobody cut a ribbon for replacing a chiller. Nobody <laughs> cut a ribbon for shaving and paving the road. But you put something new and shiny in. Well, those will those will attract some attention. Yeah, some, no, some no brass money, and you'll have your MP in from Ottawa. And yeah. Like every, everybody will be ready to cut that. Right. Ribbon. Drop the check. OK, see you later. Now we're stuck figuring out how to get it all done. You know, this gets back to my 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 view about what, when I was talking about one city and we're not going to get into that. But uh, the importance. But we I think we'll both agree the importance of cities in terms of dealing with all of these uh, programs from the other levels of government, whatever they may be, you know, for example, uh, international students, bringing in more international students, the cities uh, in, in Waterloo region has to deal with the fallout of all of that in terms of housing, food insecurity, all those other things that uh, come with that. And and we only have the limited property tax base. I know you mentioned user fees, but that's such a small, that's the tip of the tail of the, of the dog. Well, and, and use, user fees include at the at the local level the the water utility rates, right? So I mean, yeah, if you look okay, at the yeah, sure, if, if you look at the city split of the budget, about forty percent of it might be property taxes, about forty percent of it might be water, wastewater, stormwater fees, and the other twenty percent are other kinds of user fees, some grants that you occasionally get, like right. the gas tax fund or the Canadian Community Building Fund or whatever it's called tomorrow, and. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and maybe interest off of off of some investments the municipality is able to make off of the money that it's not currently using because it's sitting in, in, in the reserve fund and waiting for for the big capital project. And so so, you know, the at, at budget time, right, you get a lot of focus on the operating budget. Um, yeah. But the, the water utility budget right, is, is considerable in size and the rate changes are, are about the same. But you I don't know. focus much on that because you have to do it. And on the yeah, operating right. budget, you're like, do we really need to spend an extra two percent to be able to? No, I don't know if we need right, if we need to add a little bit more to maintain I the know. road. What We're, do you mean we added three new parks? We got to maintain three new parks. Ah, we right. won't include that. It's like an arena. Build an arena. Now you got to operate it. Now you got all the heating, cooling costs, chilling costs, whatever. All those costs that uh, come with it. Um, the uh, and that's that leads to the discussion about uh, you know this concept called infrastructure deficit. Yeah, no, it's uh, you know when I showed up on council, uh, uh, I remember hearing a presentation at budget time about you know you, you've looked out. There's this ten year forecast of projects that you're you're approving in principle, right? You prove the year that you're budgeting, but then the next nine years, this is what we think we'll be doing. Um, and the staff are saying, well, the gap between what we've got in the plan and what we know needs to be done is uh, over this 10 years is $150 million. So that's our infrastructure gap. 100. Wow. What? That, yeah. OK. OK. First year. What do I do about that? Find out more. Like what? What? OK. Well, hold so on. Wait, before long, you get to that, what's a 1% yeah, yeah. property tax increase? How much money does that generate? When I started about six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, uh, <laughs> and when I when I finished closer to eight hundred thousand over those twelve years, so, so not uh, even a so million yeah. bucks, right? So <laughs> yeah, so one hundred and fifty over ten years, fifteen million dollars uh, uh, a year. That's uh, what twenty uh, twenty five percent, right? Um, right. So like that's that that's sort of the 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 number. And then the next year, the number was higher, right? It turns out old stuff keeps getting older um, and there's more of it coming due the, the longer you kick the can down the road. And, and I think council as a whole was, you know, some members were like, this problem's too big. The number changes all the time. I don't get it. I can't wrap my hound around it, head around it. We'll just keep doing what we can do yeah. and, and just sort of head in the sands uh, and deal with that. But by, by the end of the 
first term, count, you know, Councilor being convinced by staff to fund. Let's start looking at this asset management challenge that we've got in more detail. Let's go out and really drill down on it to understand it, to get some really solid numbers on, on what it is, what's causing it, how we can forecast it better, how we can plan better, how we can manage this better. And also to sell council on 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 funding it uh, better. So we we approved that in the in the first year, and in in the first term. And so when I was going into my my second term, I I knew this was going to be a problem. I knew this was something I wanted to tackle. People generally don't run on you know as I said the ribbon cutting on shaving and paving a road or replacing a chiller, but I I made it one of two things that I talked about in that in that first reelect to say we need to have uh, an affordable and sustainable plan. To renew our infrastructure, so just, that Jeff, just your kids you, have the same Jeff, stuff my kids do. Right? Just before so you get onto right. that, just before you get yeah, onto yeah. that, I just want to double check. When you said approved, what was approved in the first term? What when so you said? We, so, so we approved some capital funding. I don't know. It was a couple hundred thousand dollars for staff to okay. go secure some consultants to build some systems to do some work uh, okay, to so, calm some people onto uh, the project. So okay, that we so could you needed get more information. Yeah, more information yeah, yeah. to understand what was going on. Okay. Yeah, and so that that you know, staff came up with that. That seemed prudent to me. I was starting to understand yeah. the size of the problem, and it's like, okay, okay, let's get more information. Let's let's understand this because for council to choose to fund something, you have to know what kind of difference it's going to make. Right. right? You can't it, if it's a big black box. Throwing more money into the big black box is not exactly high on your priority list, unless you know the outputs are going to be something you can tell people is better for right. them and it was worthwhile to do. Right. And you had, you had no answers to those questions at that point. No, I, I didn't. No idea what it was going to be, but I, I, I knew that we were going to need something, and yeah. I thought it would be helpful, but uh, to to have run on trying to solve a problem. So if you have to make a hard vote later, you can go back and point and say, "Look, I said we were going to try to solve this. This was yeah. one of the reasons I said I wanted to come back was to work on this. Now I'm working so on I, it. Here it is. So how would that process go with the consultants? So it, it was interesting. Staff uh, actually invited, uh, as finance chair, invited me in to, uh, to sit with the RFP review process. So I, I got to take a look at uh, at the bid submissions and the rest as that had got scoped up, which isn't isn't typical. But I think they saw uh, staff saw a potential champion around the council table and keep a guy that wants information engaged and, and you'll get better outcomes. Well, the finance, the um, finance chair is a good a good champion for this particular issue. <laughs> <laughs> this this was and 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 they they they'd seen the you know municipal staff watch campaigns right they know what people are saying out there yeah yeah uh, they're trying to figure out how things are going to work in the next council term that, that's um, a that's a whole thing in itself uh, staff trying to yeah. figure out what 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 do they what's the bits and bytes what did they pull up in their hand to, for the next term <laughs> yeah what so what's coming yeah so I mean I started going to some conferences uh, AMO the Association of Municipalities Ontario uh, yeah. was running on on asset management. There were some leaders in the field at the time that had done a few things. I think Thunder Bay had done some work. There were some municipalities out east in the Atlantic provinces that had done some work. Um, and I remember one of those sessions. Uh, they had they they put a graph on screen of here was our current state right over the next 10, 15 years. It was OK and it was going to become really bad. Right. And you could sort of see the color change in in your mix of assets in good condition and assets in poor condition and assets right. in very poor condition. Um, and then they said, so here's the investment choice that we provide council and here's the change to the graph. So I, I pulled over our like general manager of infrastructure services or public works or the, the titles changed after that. But but I, I said, we need that. Council needs to see that. Like the, the end output of this has to be something that graphically we can tell council where we're at, where we're going, and what happens if we do different things. Um, so that you can see the change. Yeah. You're not going to be able to physically wrap your head around the $2 billion in assets the city runs and say, haha, I see it. But you can see it in graphical form as you get less bad and more good. <laughs> But does that also, did, yeah, so over time things change for sure. But I guess you also get an idea on the extent of the dollar number you're talking about. When we talk about infrastructure deficit, it's the the, the cost to replace uh, infrastructure and how are we funding that? So you, you, did you have an idea on that number when you were getting into this at the start? Well, I, I, I didn't, but I'll, I'll tell you one thing and then I'll tell you the answer to that. Yeah. Um, 
first thing is the, the output of this that the consultant sort of built with us um, was something we call a decision support system. It basically took all the inputs of what we know about our assets, all the stuff we're doing to our assets, right? Whether it's fixing a pothole, whether it's sort of going and doing a maintenance repair on something, whether it's replacing a roof, so that you could build that all into a collective system. And based on, you know, either industry standard practice for depreciation, right? It's like how, how long before you have to replace it? How long before you have to right. do these operations? There are many standard operating procedures for a lot of infrastructure assets for how that works. Um, age-based, condition-based, all those, you plug all that in and you can get a 25-year forecast of these are the, the investments that are due at this time. And then you add them up, right? And you could look at our current financial plan, right? What was in the forecast? What are the budgeted funding levels for infrastructure and in transportation, infrastructure and recreation? Apply those to what's coming up and see what the deficit is, right? And see what happens when you don't make that investment and have those sort of kick down the count. So we had a system that would forecast all of that for you. And if you tweak the inputs, if you say, what happens if we put a 2% escalator, if we increase the amount we're spending by 2% every year, what does right. that look like, right? What if it's 5% every year? What if it's, right? What if yeah. we focus on these assets? What do we focus on those? And you could pull down very granular into very subtype, uh, into very small subsets of our asset pool of our $2 billion in assets and, and see the effect of making certain investments. And so the first example of this that I, I sort of show where we, we could use this, the federal government had come up with a program of uh, water, right? Uh, improving water infrastructure around the country. These are big, expensive things. Um, and our stormwater assets, our stormwater ponds in particular, right? They need to be cleaned out about every 10 to 15 years. Our funding meant we could clean them out every 175 years. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 175, right. 10 to 15. Yeah. Um, so the feds came through, they had some funding. So we could do about five ponds and you could see the, ref you could see what was happening in the graph from from making that investment. And we could yeah. sort of show, this is what the Fed's grant for us did to our infrastructure profile. You can show that back to them to say, see what impact you're having? They love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you know, we, we're funding more and you know, we're, we're increasing stormwater rates to get to a sustainable level to replace this. But what it did was on the stormwater ponds, it accelerated our path to balance, our path to not having that deficit by about five years, that federal investment. And we so, could model that, show that, and see that, you know, instead of it happening, us getting there in 2036, I'm going to make up a number, we get there in 2027. Right, right. right. I, I that, hope you added a ribbon cutting. Does. I hope you added a ribbon cutting with the feds on that. Uh, <laughs> we were in City Hall. I, was, I remember that. I still have photos. Um, nothing very sexy to show. You don't really want to show the muck that comes out of those ponds <laughs> no. when you're when you're cleaning them out. I understand. Yeah, but so that that is uh, brilliant. I mean, to be able to have that to, to show now. The federal government. So you're like you said, how many uh, stormwater ponds did you have? I was just curious. <laughs> uh, I, I think that one funded five or six. I don't remember the number that we have. It's 20, 30, 30 like, but, but it accelerated but, well, our me, program. Let me significantly. ask you this though. So the other thing though, too, is when you're, when you're trying to forecast, you're also considering the, like, uh, we'll say like level of service or level of repair. And I remember yeah. when I was mayor uh, and we had a consultant, we, everyone was required to bring in a consultant who took a look at your assets and said whether they were like an A, B, C, D or E grade and what you had to do uh, to get them up. And like for road repair it was like digging out the road and, and a base of eight inches of this and five inches of that. And we were in the shave and pave uh, yeah. reality. That's all I knew at the time. Yeah, so, so two things on that, because that was actually one of my intros in the first term to understanding the infrastructure cycle, right? Because everybody right. can get a road, right? Because you all drive over them or yeah. walk beside them and hear drivers cursing about the potholes. You, you, everybody sees that. Um, but like a, a road can last you 50 years, right? If, if you, you build it right, you maintain it right, you can last 50, 60 years. But the way you treat those roads, the first thing that you'll start to do, you'll start to see cracks in a new road show up. So you got to seal those cracks. Yeah. Then you'll start to see potholes appeal, uh, appearing where some of those cracks sort of hit the side and they grow a little bit. Right. And so you got you to seal those those pieces. And about after about 20, 20, 25 years, your road is in a state that you shave and pave it. You take the top layer off. Maybe there's some repairs to the bottom. Uh, uh, spot clean, and then you, you put a new coat on and you go through the cycle again, you know, seal the cracks, do the other piece. And then when you get yeah. to 50 years, 
then you got to dig the whole thing out because the base has failed. The stuff underneath the top layer okay. of the road has has failed. And and if you if you just shave and pave on top of it, it'll crumble very quickly because right. the base has failed underneath it. Water's getting in and up and and, and your, your lifespan is a lot less. And so the way you keep a road going is you do the treatments when you need to do the treatments. You've got enough money in your annual maintenance budget to seal the cracks as they open. You've got enough money at your 20 to 25 to shave and pave the road. And then it lasts long enough. Whereas if you don't do that, your, your base is going to fail by year, I, I don't know, 30 rather than year 50. Right, right. Right. And, and shaving and paving on top isn't going to solve your problem. You need to go all the way down. And so I had some circumstances in neighborhoods where, you know, a neighborhood built in the 1950s, 1960s, you can tell by the number on the sewer grate, right? Well, what year right, that was put right, in. Right, right. Yep, yep. And you're going around your neighborhood and you want to know. Um, <laughs> they're like, well, my road's so bumpy, you need to fix it. I said, you need a total redo. And we have 10 roads for every one road we are funding for right now. So I'm sorry, you're not at the top of the list. They yeah. don't like to hear that, especially when uh, the house is uh, two million dollars. Um, they really don't like me saying that. But the yeah. neighborhood over, whose streets were built in the late seventies or early eighties, the city's gone in and they've done a shave and pave. Why? Because we started to put more infrastructure money yeah, yeah. in. And if you if you make the investment at the right time, our model could show that's how you extend the life of the assets. That was your best funding was at yeah, that twenty twenty five year mark. Save the base by doing the top. Like, why are they getting the new road? They had one. I've been here for a You know, the system is optimizing the investments because we all know there's not enough money. And so you got to put it where it makes the most good and the, and the most. And so I had I had lots of angry people when I knocked on that door in the name. Why is my road not getting done? Well, right. our system says our optimal investment is to do it over here. And it's complicated. Not it, not you, can't, you can't see underneath what's going on. I guess uh, one way to know who your local counselor is, is the person that's uh, with their head down looking at uh, dates on grates. <laughs> I, that, that, that's a way to find to find out, right? So that, that's, that's an example, right? And, and our, yeah. our decision support system won, won a national and provincial awards on, on things for the ability to look yeah. at all these components together and optimize investments. I, and I so that was it. the second term gave us that, right? That, and we still didn't fund more money. I was going to say, you yeah, identify, yeah, yeah. you identify, like you hear about the problem. Now you get a better picture on the problem and you're getting an idea what the cost of it is. So how do you fund that? That's the next part of the problem. Yeah. Well, and you'd said originally, what was the number what you expected? Well, the numbers I told you at the beginning, when we were only looking at 10 years rather than average over 25 years, yeah. they were about right. Like we staff were pretty good with the okay. data we had at giving us the right number. You divide that sort of 225 million in that second year by 10, about 22 and a half a year. That's almost exactly where, uh, uh, where our decision support system model landed at, uh, at the time based on, uh, and things have gone up from there because construction costs have ballooned and, You've added some more data that we didn't oh, ever have before. Yeah, we're so, talking so post-COVID, yeah. supply chain, inflation. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. Yeah, we, we had projects coming in 30 to 70% over, and that was just industry. Um, yeah. And so that's harder to model. So things are worse now, but they're better than they would have been. And that's the hardest right, sell in politics. But, but we things are better than the funding. Rate. How do you yeah, fund it? How did you fund it? Yeah, yeah. So, so we had the model. The first thing that we did, because everybody said, I, I want you to spend every dollar you have wisely is we did a whole review of our capital reserves, right? And, and our reserve fund policies so that we were able to optimize the number and balance of those reserves to stretch the dollars as much as we have. Because sometimes you've got minimum balances, you're forecasting for this project, but if you look at them a different way, you're like, well, we actually have two or three million more dollars than we thought to spend just by mm. looking at the financial policies around all of those. So that's very oh, nitty gritty okay. work. Yeah. Um, but that was the first phase of our uh, of our efforts. The second phase was um, council tweaked another policy uh, that actually had come from before my time. It was uh, the first move that council did on assets in the late 2000s was for every new dollar in growth, in assessment growth that we got, we set aside 40 cents into reserve funds rather than spend it in the operating budget. Nobody else sort of does that. Oh, so we sh we started sheltering in the late 2000s, 40 cents of every new growth dollar away in the capital uh, reserve, 20 cents in capital. Yeah, so let's, for funding let's explain new things, that. And 20 cents growth. in reinvestment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's explain so, that a little bit more. What what, what yeah, that? So I got, it's, but I just want to say just quick, we we always yeah. we always we're doing the budget. You know, it's like oh, it's going to be an eight percent increase, and we always say, well, what's the assessment growth number? And they'll say, oh, it's two percent. 
Uh, okay, we so great. So now we're down to you know from eight to six. But explain what exactly. that assessment growth uh, is. So let's pretend you've got a town of ten houses. Yeah. So here's your here's your base budget. You got a hundred thousand budget, right? You're getting I guess ten thousand dollars from each house. High property taxes in a small town. Yeah. Um, but now you get a new house. So now there's eleven houses. That one new house is assessment growth, right? It's it's a growth in yep. the amount of of sort of assessed value in your area from an addition or a substantial change, not from not from just how much your value has gone up for your house, but right. from explicitly the fact that it's a new thing that exists. That's the growth, not yeah. about how much your how much your your house value goes up or down, but the fact that there's something new. Uh, that's that's the assessment growth. So now there's eleven houses. So um, your hundred thousand dollar budget. Um, well, if you have it be one hundred and ten thousand dollars, and everybody's property taxes are zero, but you got ten thousand extra to spend because you got the new house paying the bill. Yep. So that, that's the easiest way to shake that down. And this lesson I had to learn very quickly because I remember in my first year on council, I just bought a house, a, a condo, the, the year I ran for council. So I knew what my proper, my interim property tax bill was. Then I passed a bunch of property tax changes. And okay. then I saw my final property tax bill. And I'm like, hold on. I didn't raise taxes by that amount. I didn't, what, what, what happened here? So I had to figure out how the system actually flows through <laughs> assessment growth changes, whether your value is up or down relative to the average value, how these right, things get right. right over a weighted assessment base. It, it's a bit complicated, but, but seeing my first ever property tax bill go from draft to final and not having it be what I thought it would be. And me being on council, I thought I should understand it. Yes. No, <laughs> since 2016, we haven't had to go through that exercise. I mean, I'm, uh, to, I'm, to a reassessment. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. To a reassessment. <laughs> Yeah, like the average house valued at three hundred and forty-eight thousand. Uh huh. Right. So just continue on then. Like you yeah. were just giving an example of assessment growth, and so you guys were yeah, putting yeah. putting aside a p rather than putting that all to lowering a property tax, you yeah. you use part of it to lower property taxes, but part of it to go into reserve funds. Yeah. So we we, we were shoving seven to forty percent away into reserve funds, half of it for building new stuff. Yeah. And half of it for replacing old stuff, right? So 20 cents for replacing old stuff to create that reserve to start doing that rehabilitation. So the other tweak that we made right before we talked about infrastructure levies and funding this gap was we tweaked it from 2020 to 3010, right? So that, you know, so that we, we'd send a little bit more to the replace existing stuff rather uh, than build new stuff, right? So we're okay. trying to redirect, all, look at all of our different funding profiles. Yeah. How do we yeah. maximize what we're doing to deal with the gap before we ask for um, you know, increased property tax rates to help fund additional infrastructure and help close the gap. So right. those were all the setups that we got before that three year budget in my last term, which was when we, you know, we had the data, we had the charts, we'd done some public engagement to really sort of show people what, where we were going if we didn't do something different and what the gaps were. Everybody that came to those, um, Put, put their put their nickel in and said, yeah, yeah, that you, you need to fund that, right? It was right. Like nine to one in favor when people saw the data. Yeah, we didn't get a lot of people, but uh, you know, we 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 took this traveling roadshow to all the other consultations that we were running, right? Not just to have its own, but this thing's happening, and we're we're replacing this stuff at at Rim Park. We're doing this new field or whatever. By the way, let's talk about asset management. Yeah. So we we brought the traveling roadshow to where people were already. Which Calling is good. Us what they thought, yeah, yeah. yeah. because it, because it's surprising how few people show up when you do budget consultations. You yeah. don't get a lot so of people did, coming I, out. I I knew that wasn't going to work, right? I, I I was pressing our team for how can we be creative, recognizing it's a very difficult thing to consult on because it's very abstract yeah. and it's very numbers yeah, yeah, based yeah. and driven. So that that's where the visuals sort of help people, right? They, right. They could get it. Right. But let me ask you then, I mean, obviously the assessment growth piece wasn't going to be enough to fund this thing. So oh, God, what was, yeah. So, so you, and you, you got to get it from the, from the taxpayers. So how did you get it from the taxpayers? Yeah. And so the other thing we were doing along with this was a, a long-term financial plan as well. And so you can blend the two together. You can forecast your expenses and you can see right. what would it take to close this gap within a couple of decades. Right? Yeah, I was going to say 30 and, years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if it takes 70 years to create a problem, it's going to take more than seven minutes to solve it. Total fair. Um, yes, totally and, fair. And, and so let's look at for a couple of decades. And the staff uh, long-term financial plan said, you know, we need to do, you know, one and a half percent 
as a whether it's a levy or whether you roll it in, um, uh, you know, for about 15 years to close the to close the gap you know, every single year. Now, that didn't quite wash at the council table when we when we got there as finance chair, you're trying to find <laughs> a way for five hands to go up on something. Right? Five, for out, a majority of, five to go out up. of nine or five out of eight. Yeah. Five out of eight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, to, 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 to go up. And uh, uh, and we got uh, we got seven out of eight. And I think the one hand that didn't go up was because I'm sorry, I, I should say the other part first. Council agreed to a one percent you know, levy piece over that oh, okay. three year budget. One percent, one percent, one percent. Yeah. And uh, and and the, the one vote against said no, I, I, the staff report said one point five. So I think we should do one point five. So the, the vote against wasn't a vote against. It Which you would have been for, fine with the one point five. You would have been fine with that. I mean, realistically, that's what it probably should be. Yeah. And I, I made a speech at the time because you know, this is what politicians do. Uh, but but standing in the chair for making the argument for this, knowing that yeah. there was a discussion happening. Um, my, my view isn't since. Since you know municipalities have sixty percent of the infrastructure, but they get ten percent of all the all the tax right, dollars in the country, right, right? you see yeah. that number, right? Yeah, most yeah. of the tax revenues at the federal level, most of the infrastructure is at the municipal level. Yes, um, that we can't let them off the hook. The idea of us solving this whole problem ourselves made no sense to me in a federation where uh, these things are being downloaded six ways from Sunday, and yeah. and and the place for some revenue was there. So I so this was a really good argument for. Um, you know, doubling the gas tax from the from the feds or whatever the numbers were that FCM oh, okay. was sort of putting up. So I wanted right, to link right. it into the current FCM campaign for asking the feds for more. Gotcha. And what the feds ended up doing for that you know, for one year of COVID was they doubled it for a year. Right. Um, I, I think or maybe it was a year before COVID. They doubled it that one year, but it was just temporary because right. they had some extra money. Um, but if it was made permanent, that would have shaved. I think I calculated that that would have shaved four years off of our you know, uh, yeah, off of that, our that, infrastructure gap forecast, just from doing that definitely. and having that be a base. And if the uh, province was doing the same, yeah, then that would shave another five years and that would be the balance, right? So I, 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 didn't, remember, want, I, I didn't want us on a roller coaster that took us to solving the whole problem ourselves when it really should be shared. No, absolutely. And that's the problem with social services, those provincial initiatives that end up on the local levy. I remember uh, Doug Craig when he was uh, mayor and was on a, I don't know if, I don't know if it was a large city caucus or whatever it was. And, and, and they were trying to propose, look, just give us back 1% of the taxes you take out of our community from the province or yeah. the feds. And and that would be a significant amount of money that we would have back to us. Just the amount of money that's taken out of our community is tremendous and uh, just puts such a strain on us. So, okay. So you get the 1%. Yeah. And now though, you, you like capital levies seem to be a pretty common thing now with, with uh, municipal budgets. Yeah. So when we, when we did ours, there were a few examples, right? Including in the region, I think Woolwich should done one um, the, the year before. Um, but I don't think anybody else in the region had done one yet. But now most of the municipalities in the in the region of Waterloo yeah. have something like Cambridge just tacked one on. Um, uh, and, you know, Wilmot has done the right. So there's yeah. these, these we things had, sort of uh, in North Dumfries exist. in North Dumfries, because one percent back then was thirty thousand uh, dollars. We we yeah. we had a we did a special levy for fire and we might have done a capital one as well. Just uh, and I would just say, look. You know, it's that volunteer fire department. You want a pumper truck. This is this is what these things cost. And we got to start putting money aside. It's just uh, it's all there is to it. So, yeah. And, know, and, and so, you know, from, from, from running on from seeing this problem in the first term and running on solving it in the second and then the third saying, no, no, now we're really going to vote for it right now that we've got all the information. Um uh, to, you know, this first term after I've left council, seeing that it wasn't an add on to the budget. It wasn't a, you have to vote to put this in specially. It came right. in the base budget yeah. as, as the staff recommended budget and yeah. council didn't appear. I didn't watch it closely, but council didn't really appear to be debating, uh, you know, upending that. It's now Not part of change. the culture of we yeah. got to solve this stuff. Right, right. So, okay, so let's transition. Unless there's something else you want to add on this. I want to transition to the three year budget concept. It's a good place to transition. I was going to try to do that myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, you know, we, we read in the paper, Waterloo does this three-year budget, um, and it's, you know, not done anywhere else locally that I'm aware of. And um, so tell me about the uh, evolution to this three-year budget format for Waterloo. 
Yeah, so I, I think the rules changed in uh, in the Municipal Act in about 2006 to allow this. I think that's true. I, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, um, but uh, <laughs> in that in that first term before I came on, um, the CFO of the day convinced you know the Mayor Haller and Council that uh, we should try this new thing. Right? We should. A, we've got a four year term. Um, which was new then, right? It had been three year terms up till there. We got four year term. Let's do a one year budget in the first year. Cause you know, you show up in December, you got to have a budget like next week. So yeah. we'll do a one year budget that first term. We'll spend the next six months doing strategic planning. And then we'll build a three year budget. The rest of the years in the term, we'll build into one budget. We'll approve it really at the end of that first full year on council. And then now you've got a budget for the rest of the trip, and we can focus staff time and and council focus on. Yeah, doing we'll get to that in a sec. I just want to. Yeah, we'll get to yeah, the yeah. benefits in a sec, and, and that's a great benefit. So, so, that's, uh, so that's a three year budget, right? It's a, yeah, your approach so three years at once. You debate it all at the same time. You yeah. sometimes will look at this and go, you know what? Can we move this forward a couple of years? Can we push this back a couple of years? And you can see it all, right? You get you see that whole picture. Three years of capital spending. Um, and then each year that, it, you know, in, in year two and year three of that uh, three year budget, yeah, it's got to come back before council and you've got to yeah. affirm it. But I just wanted to pick up on Jeff before we move into it too deeply here was just this general concept that in that first year of the term of council, it's not the three year budget. And, and I think that's a great benefit because especially if you have, if you have new counselors coming on, just just understanding the concept of a budget and what you can do and what you can't do to be faced with a three year budget right off the hop would be a bit overwhelming. And uh, at least by having that sort of that inaugural year, it's like your 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 ta you know pro property taxes one hundred and one before you got into the more advanced property tax class, which is the three year, is a benefit. Uh, uh I, I, absolutely. And and really, you've got these four year strategic plans. I, think I, I always got questions from folks about. So how do, how does the budget happen? Right. How do you actually get to having a budget in a municipality? Um, because we don't seem to be consulted on a lot of this. Like we do. And that doesn't mean you're showing up. Uh, That's right. Exactly. Tons to oh, there's tons, tons of consultation. The, yeah. Ninety five percent of the budget making happens on the staff side. But not in a vacuum. It happens in the context of what's council's strategic plan? What are they trying right. to advance and do and change yep. in their term of council? So that'll prioritize certain things over other things. What are the base pressures for just existing as a municipality, right? What, what is our cost pressure? What are some of our revenue yep. pressures? How do we model those, right? Uh, uh, and and what, what, what number does that is staff, salary, settlements, all those things. What are all the master plans, right? What does it say in the water master plan? What does it say in the recreation master plan? What does it say in the, so what do we need to advance out of right. those? And how do we build an operating budget? How do we build a capital program based on how much money we're seeing that aligns with all of these different plans, which have been consulted on, right? Individually. Right. Especially the and master we put plans. Them all together. Right. Those yeah. have been publicly consulted upon. And those are yeah. reflections of what the public has said. This is the type of community we want. So now we're trying to make it happen financially. Yeah. Turn it into numbers yeah. um, and figure out which numbers can happen now. And, you know, because you get these master plans and they say short term, medium term, long term, not year one, year two, year three for a reason, because they all got a layer on top of each other. And there's only so much money. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of plates spinning. Um, so how did the but but how did someone how did you say, OK, we're going with this three year plan? I, 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 talk about how that came about. And then and then you could talk about the benefits so, that you were touching so on. That, the, so the first three year budget happened in 2007. That was three years before I joined council. Um, my understanding of that was that the CFO of the day, uh, who was Bob Maven, had pitched it to council as as a way to uh, it was a new tool that you could use and a way to um, create some efficiency with staff time. Right. Like the amount of stuff that goes on, like it's a duck on water, the amount of pedaling underneath that's uh, going on with those with those flippers for staff to produce a budget every year. Right. Thousands of hours, right? That you, you sort of are spending in all the different departments yeah. and council and the public time. Council meetings so too, do, yeah. Yeah. So if you can do that two times in four years rather than four times in four years, that's two years worth of budget making yeah. in time you're saving and you can apply it to other things. There were... Um, there was a change to accounting rules that happened in that period. Um, very sexy stuff, I know. Uh, I know, but I know important. It's pins in the eye. <laughs> but, but, and, and actually, those changes to accounting rules, staff were able to change the accounting system over to manage these things without asking council for any more money because they had two years of budgets they didn't have to do. 
right? right. So they okay, could actually yeah. focus on updating the accounting yeah. system. And yeah. if you want to talk about the infrastructure story, as I understand it, talking to our finance people, it actually started with the accounting rule change because it made certain things visible that weren't visible before. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was more, it seemed more fuller disclosure, but you're not sure how that all came about. But anyways, magic dust that happened. But let me, yeah. but let me just uh, say this, the, the, while it's a three-year budget, it's, it's still subject to annual approvals, right? Absolutely. So there's a there's a policy that council adopted at the time as well that says, so when do we have to say, OK, I know we did this three year budget, but this isn't working. Right? We got to change. And so there are some guardrails put on it. Right. If assessment growth is much higher or much lower than you were expecting, that creates holes or creates surplus revenue or yeah. you know, a gap in revenue. You got to yeah. deal with that. Maybe you got to reopen the budget. If the economy goes into a frickin' tailspin, yeah, right, <laughs> and everything's so maybe that that's a good moment to. So there were a few guardrails put up, yes. Uh, and over the years, councils opened it up a couple of times. I think once in 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 my term early on, where you know the budget shrank a little bit, the property tax increase dropped, some of the allocations yeah. to departments dropped, right, um, right, because the circumstances changed. Um, and then the other time that, that I think people were wondering if we should. It didn't tweak policy, but during COVID, right? During that first COVID, you know, phase, right? Those yeah. first few years of COVID, um, before we decided to let it rip, was uh, uh, there was a huge hit to 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 sort of the economic indicators. But those economic indicators were actually very brief blips, right? All the federal yes. support propped yeah. up the economy, so it didn't trip any of the levers. The construction projects kept going; they were allowed to go. There was no assessment growth hole, so the the trigger wasn't there. But council was certainly very interested in seeing what it could do on an affordability basis, given the challenges people were facing. Yeah. And so well, when we looked at the budget and you looked at the strategic plan, you said, you know, all these things that were in here about equity, around closing infrastructure gaps, around trying to build a city where people can recreate outside and, and be together. Those seem more important now than they actually did when we passed it. So right. hacking those doesn't make sense. Um, the feds were supp supplying money to support the revenue hole we had in recreation, which was temporary. Yep. So there wasn't really anything we could do on the operating budget side that was affecting property taxes. But we'd had a good year um, on the on the utility side. So we froze. We were able to freeze utility rates rather than have them go up, which okay. delivered probably about 40 or uh, on our portion of it, since part of it was the region. But our portion of it would have been maybe 30 or 35 bucks. Um, which is sort of half of half of that planned rate, and would have would have been equivalent to slashing the property tax rate uh, change in half, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so we yeah. were able to deliver some some savings because we were able to look at our reserves and say we're okay now, and we can spread out, you know, this this deferred revenue over the next ten years, and we'll be all right. So there there are operational benefits to the three year budget. Sometimes, though, there's political downfall to the three-year budget in terms of the cumulative rate that people look at. And, and I'm thinking about currently where it was, you know, over 20 percent. But then I thought, you know, if you added the, the region's last two budgets, that was over 15 percent. So, you know what I mean? It's like uh, – yeah, and on, the, on, the, on the same day, the headline down below was showing that Cambridge had a had a property tax rate change that was higher than it was in Waterloo, and their next three years in their forecast were higher. Than in yeah. so, but yeah, those yeah, didn't yeah, get yeah, totaled. Yeah. I think that's. I think the political downside is all is all in the reporting. Um, okay, I want to I, I want to shift quickly because we don't have a lot of time. I want to talk about CPI and MPI. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of times we talk about the budget and it's like it's got it can't go above the inflation rate or the or the consumer price index uh, rate. But Waterloo had a concept uh, called the uh, municipal price index or MPI, uh, which was supposed to be sort of an answer to that, I guess. What well, explain a little bit about that? Yeah, MPI was also a, a CFO Bob Maven special from the 2006, 2010 period, right? When the three-year budget came in. Because then how do you forecast what you should have over that period of time? So I think this was a tool to sort of try to do that. S CPI, when you think about it, is compiled by StatScan. It's the intent of it is to look at a basket of goods that's common to say the average household and to monitor how much the prices of that basket of goods is changing on a year-to-year -year basis. You throw it all together, that's CPI. Yeah. Um, maybe your household experiences that CPI. Maybe it doesn't. Depends on your choices. Right. But it's typical. Municipalities aren't houses, right? We have uh, we have different different pressures. We spend our money on different. We spend money on different things. Most people don't build roads, 
um, uh, with, yes. with their budget, right? Most right. people don't operate recreation facilities. So exactly. Most yes. people don't have a large team of hired staff to deliver services. A couple of people do. Most people don't. Uh, so, so the idea behind the municipal price index was to create an index that was specific to what municipal expenses look like and to do the same general thing. And in that first few years, it ended up being a little bit higher than, than CPI. Construction costs are a significant part. Fuel is a higher part. Some wage settlements were higher in that period. So it was it came in higher than CPI, but council kept to this municipal price index so that they could say they were they were keeping to an inflationary rate. And this was controversial. <laughs> but you know what? But 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 Jeff, it's it's a municipal. It's an inflationary rate specific to municipalities. I mean, if it came in at the same as CPI all the time, then what's the purpose, right? I mean, you would expect it not to come in the same as CPI. Yeah, you, you would. And uh, I think part of the critique of it was uh, folks. Some folks saw it as self-serving because the city of Waterloo was creating it for the city of Waterloo. It wasn't created by some third party, um, and it generally wasn't done anywhere else. And so that makes things suspect. Um, especially if they're seen to be increasing taxes at a rate higher than CPI, and if the people think that CPI is the only possible number for tax increases. Where does that come from, that general view? You know, I I, I think one of the challenges of you know the municipal budget setting process and property tax processes are that it's about the only cost you have in life that you feel that you get a vote on. Yeah, true. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, like I, I guess you kind of do for the feds, but most of the stuff for the federal and provincial money is income tax based, right? It, it's yeah. about you earning more money. It's not about them changing the income tax rate and charging you more money. So it's not the same thing. Um, and, and, but on the property tax rate, it's like, oh, they increase property taxes again. Well, it's because as the economy goes up and down, our revenue doesn't go up and down. It's based on this other thing. Yeah. Like maybe it's not great, but it's what we got. Uh, and, and so there's, people sort of have tension with that. And I think the, from what I've heard from folks, the idea seems to be if you're doing something above inflation, you are a net adder to my misery and pain from inflation. If you are <laughs> adder below, then at least you're not making my problem worse. You're, you're not making inflation higher or is that like I, there, there are a wide range of arguments. Isn't driving over crappy roads adding to your, uh, you know, your problem in life too, your inconvenience in life, your uncomfortableness in life? But that's a separate email. That, that's, uh, that's an email to complain about the state of the roads, not an email to complain about the state of the municipal budget. Maybe stats can't. Turns out they're related, been, but yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe stats can't should have been retained to come up, to work on this MPI concept. I, you know, I think that could have been interesting. Um, uh, but, but anyway, so one of the things that, that we saw is limiting, because then in my first term of council, MPI took a dip. <laughs> and it was it went but there was a piece, period of wage restraint in the public ah, sector that okay. was below inflation and yeah. so all of a sudden we were getting less than inflation with mpi and that that created some some pressures okay. and the other thing was you know when you constantly hold yourself to an inflationary budget no matter how defined inevitably there's going to be some stuff that gets left behind right like you, you constantly we squeezed in a new fire station we squeezed in a new library branch to inflation even though those are massive increases in services yes. and costs firefighters yeah. are not cheap the, no. the trucks are cheap by comparison you, you buy them once every 15 years right uh, but the firefighters you have every year uh, do good work not cheap and uh, and trying to fit all that in to an inflationary tax increase crowds other things out. And that was the pressure we started facing. And I noticed in that first year, the first term on council was the city's getting bigger. We're getting new roads, we're getting new parks, but those departments aren't getting any more money to maintain any of that stuff. And people start to notice when the parks aren't getting maintained in the same yeah, level. Or the hours are cut. So listen, Jeff, on the theme of crowding out, we're done. <laughs> yeah. You talk, for, talk about money for hours, but, yeah. uh, but we have one. Listen, thanks, uh, Jeff. I really appreciate uh, this opportunity to have this, uh, you know, fulsome discussion on, on these, these issues. Uh, I know we could go on for more. And sometimes some people might think, oh, you did a whole show on that. But yeah, no, it was great. Thank you very much uh, for the time and, and all the best. No problem. There's a lot of fun in finance. <laughs> yeah. There is no fun in finance. <laughs> There's fin yeah. in finance. <laughs> That's what I'm learning in my household. <laughs> Uh, thank you for listening to another edition of the Old Grey Mayors podcast. If you have any ideas for stories or people you would 
like us to interview or reach out to, please feel free to contact us. And thank you again.